let us turn now to topic number seven. And we're looking at Abraham, Ishmael, and Isaac. And the readings would be from this book here, chapter four. Chapter four of this book. And uh, as we mentioned before, both Muslims, Christians, Jews, uh, all believe that um, Abraham is the father of faith and are very impressed by this call of God to Abraham recorded in the Torah in Genesis. The Lord said to Abraham, leave your country, your people, and your father's household. Go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. And both the Muslim movement um, and the Christian movement, as well as the Jewish movement, uh, believe that they are the spiritual um, progeny of this call of God to Abraham. So let's just explore that uh, rather carefully for, for the next few minutes. I was in, in a mosque in Philadelphia on one occasion. I go many times, but this is one of those many times. And the imam was um, spending the evening with us, a group of about 30 Christians, I suppose, and about that many Muslims. He was spending the evening with us, explaining Islam to us. And what he did was to go through the pillars that we talked about this morning, the pillar of duty and the pillar of, um, of, um, of belief, pillars of belief. And after an hour or so of uh, explaining all of this to us, the time had come to leave. And then he made this interesting comment. He said, you can forget everything I said tonight, but remember one thing, never forget it. There is nothing surprising in Islam, for Islam is the religion of the natural man. Even without revelation, if you think logically and rationally, you will come to the conclusions of Islam. It's totally natural. It's a religion of the natural man, nothing surprising. And in saying that, of course, he was echoing Islamic theology. I've heard different ways of expressing this many times in my conversation with Muslims. Islam is a religion of the natural man. It's not surprising. And um, some may say, well, the Quran is a surprise, the poetry of the Quran. But I said to him, may I respond to what you're saying? He said, yes. I said, this may be true of Islam, that there's nothing surprising, but it's not true of the gospel. I said, just bear with me for a moment, please, as I try to express in your presence the surprise of the gospel. In fact, I said, the gospel is so surprising, you can't believe it without the Holy Spirit opening your heart to believe. I said, God created the heavens and the earth, and that all Muslims and Christians agree. The vast universe, those 50 billion galaxies in space that Hubble Telescope has found. When I went to high to college, I took a course in astronomy, and at that time they said there are 3,000 galaxies. And now Hubble is discovering that there's at least 50 billion of them, you know, and each one of them with trillions of stars. Huge, enormous universe. God created it all. On that, Muslims and Christians agree absolutely. But now comes the surprise. God who put all that together has entered our history in Jesus the Messiah. He was a baby born in a manger. He was a refugee in Egypt. He worked as a carpenter in Nazareth. For three years, he was a wandering preacher without even a place to lay his head. The stones became his pillows. This is God with us, the creator of the whole universe. And then when he is arrested and put on a cross between two thieves and all of our hatred and anger go crashing into him with his hands outstretched, he cries out in forgiveness for those who did this to him. I mean, this is utterly astounding. And in his resurrection, he calls us to go forth as he has gone forth, sharing his love to the nations. 
That's the gospel. I said it is so astonishing that the natural man cannot believe this good news unless the Holy Spirit opens your heart to believe. The gospel is a total astounding surprise. I said no philosophy or religion has ever imagined the gospel. And that dear Imam, with his doctor's degree from Temple University, I think it was in Islamics, said, it is impossible for God to love that much. It cannot be. I said, I beg you, let God surprise you. You have put God in a box. And you've said he cannot love that much. Let him astonish you with his surprising love. Open your heart to his spirit that you can see the wonder of it all, was my plea that night. Now, this Abrahamic story um, unlocks dimensions of this surprising journey. Abraham um, and Sarah had no children, and God promised that they will have progeny. That the progeny of Abraham will be like the stars in the sky, like the sand by the seaside. And through his seed, all nations will be blessed. Well, how can this happen when Sarah is barren, you see? And so year after year, no child born. And then Sarah concocts a grand plan. Abraham sleep with my maid, Hagar, and bear a child to her. And that way we could help God out. It, it's, and so Abraham does that, you see. And, uh, you know, there's nothing surprising laying with a woman of 30 years of age if she becomes pregnant. Nothing surprising about that at all. This is absolutely natural. And so it's not surprising that Hagar becomes pregnant and a son is born, Ishmael. And um, about 12 years later, why um, the Lord comes by Abraham's home uh, in the form of three, three, three men, I believe it was. And, um, says, uh, Abraham, you're going to have a son. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. Here he is. Come on, Ishmael. And Ishmael comes running over. Here he is. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> the son's been born. Oh, oh no, the Lord says, it'll be to Isaac. It'll be to Sarah that the son will be born. And uh, Sarah is in her tent, and she starts chuckling. She's 90 years old, 89. How could she have a son? She's too old. I mean, I have a 72-year-old wife. Suppose I would go home and she would say she's pregnant. I mean, it's just, off, off. It's just uh, impossible, you know. Come on, you quit, quit joking with us. And, and Abraham himself falls down on the ground and rolls over laughing, back and forth laughing. He, he himself is is uh, overwhelmed with this surprise. He can't, he can't, everybody knows that this is a joke. And um, Abraham says, look, please bless Ishmael. Please bless Ishmael. And God says, <clears throat> God says, Abraham, I've, uh, I've, heard, your, I've heard your plea. And um, I'm going to bless Ishmael. I'm going to bless Ishmael, just as you asked me to bless Ishmael. This is in, in, um, in Genesis chapter 16, we read this. I will bless Ishmael. <clears throat> but sure enough, Sarah becomes <coughs> pregnant. And when she's 90 years old, she gives birth to Isaac. And she says, we're going to call his name Isaac, which means laughter. 
for throughout the centuries, people are going to chuckle whenever they hear that a 90-year-old woman had a baby. It is just so absolutely amazing. It's so surprising, you see? So absolutely surprising. Now, Galatians is very interesting uh, about all of this. Galatians chapter, chapter 4. We read in chapter 4 of Galatians um, regards to, in regards to this, this surprise. Verse 21. Tell me, you who are under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, verse 22, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born in the ordinary way, not the surprising way, see? There's nothing surprising about Ishmael. But the son by the free woman was born as a result of promise. And this promise is a grand surprise, you see. And he goes on then to develop this theology of, of the natural man and the surprising gift of grace, you see. Um, he, he points out that the people, as they approach God, can go in two different directions. The one is the natural way in which we attempt to bring about God's purposes, his kingdom, his way, in our natural approach to things. And the other is opening ourselves to the surprises of grace, the surprises of Isaac, as it were, you see. And so I, would, I feel that figuratively, within my own soul, there is this struggle between the Isaac way of God bringing about his kingdom and the Ishmael way, you see. So the struggle is not just out there, as it were, between Islam and gospel. The struggle is also within my own soul that I understand this very, very well. What was going on in Abraham's home? The struggle between Hagar and Sarah, later on between Ishmael and Isaac, when Isaac is born, the struggle within Abraham's own soul, the struggle about the natural way of bringing it about, and the surprising way, which has to do with grace all the way, you see. Um, and Galatians pushes out on those themes quite, quite amazingly. <clears throat> Well, the conflict became so severe after Isaac is born that uh, Sarah said, you got to send Hagar away and Ishmael away. And it was tremendously difficult for Abraham to accept that. But uh, there was no alternative. That home was in serious conflict. And so Abraham sends, sends Ishmael and Hagar away. And they go off into the desert. And there's no water. All that Abraham gave to them was a satchel, a, a knapsack of food, and a jug of water. And he sends his firstborn son away in that way. Nothing. I mean, imagine the sense of abandonment. Here is Ishmael, about 13 years of age at this time, and Hagar, and off they're sent, off into the desert. Abraham was an extremely wealthy man. He had camels and donkeys and all kinds, servants and whatnot and whatnot. But he sends them away with nothing. And soon the food is finished, and they're thirsty, and Ishmael is well nigh to die of thirst. And Hagar is crying out, oh God, and then God opens her eyes to see some water nearby, and the boy's life is saved by that water, you see. And he grows up to be a man, and he needs a wife, and so Hagar sends, goes off to Egypt to find a wife for Ishmael. Now Isaac, I mean, uh, he has all this wealth, he inherits it all. And when Isaac is looking for a wife, what does his father do? Why, he sends his servant all the way up there to Mesopotamia with his camels loaded with provisions and wealth and uh, jewelry and whatnot and whatnot and goes up there to Mesopotamia, up, up there to uh, their homeland where the family come from there in, in Mesopotamia and, um, and goes to, 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 to the home where Abraham had come from 
and he finds a wife for Isaac, you know, and gives her gifts of gold and whatnot and whatnot, and puts her on a camel and brings her back home. Ishmael, no one's looking for a wife for him. His dad isn't paying any attention at all. The point I'm trying to make is the deep sense of abandonment and being sent away. And I feel that Islam feels that abandonment very deeply. I mean, every year in the, um, in the pilgrimage to Mecca, the pilgrims enact, they act out that abandonment. You know, they walk back and forth between two mountains, the pilgrims. What are they doing? They're emulating Hagar walking back and forth in the desert looking for water for Ishmael. That's what they're doing, emulating this lostness of this boy. And he's well nigh dying. He's been abandoned, you see, by his own dad. And then they find water. And every year the pilgrims go there to the well of Zemzem, which they believe is where God provided the water to save Ishmael from death. And they all want to go home with some of this water, remembering that God saved Ishmael from death miraculously by, by providing this water. And then uh, at a certain point, they throw these stones at the pillars. Um, and what's all that about? You know, is they, they, the, the pillars represent Satan. They tried to kill Ishmael. And so you throw these stones at these pillars. Be gone, you Satan. You try to kill Ishmael, and you're trying to get us Muslims too. Be gone. They throw these stones at the pillars to, as, as symbolic uh, confrontation with Satan, who, who tried to get Ishmael. Now, happily within Islam, there is this uh, belief that Abraham actually came out there to that region where, where, where Ishmael was living and met with him. And, and according to Muslims, Abraham and Ishmael went to the black stone and re-established the worship of God and rebuilt the Kaaba, you see. And so Abraham, according to Islam, finally did reach out to his son and embraced him. And there was a reconciliation between Abraham and Ishmael. But, um, but, but the abandonment theme runs very, very deep in, in Islam. And I feel that as I work with Muslims that there is just this great yearning for inclusion somehow, you see. We also want to be part of the table of the party. Now, God made it very clear that Isaac is the son of promise, through whom all nations will be blessed. But if all nations are to be blessed, then indeed Ishmael is also to be blessed, you see. And Abraham, God promised Abraham, I will bless Ishmael, you see. And if we claim to be part of the faith of Abraham and Isaac and heirs of those promises to bless all nations, then indeed we must find ways to embrace Ishmael and to bless Ishmael and to assure Ishmael that they also are welcome to the table. You see, <laughs> the abandonment is no more. That as church, we want to do all we can to have open arms, a welcoming, and to, uh, an embrace. Um, that's that's, that's, our, that's our, our plea. Now, at the center of the pilgrimage is, um, is uh, this annual sacrifice that takes place where, where, where um, hundreds of thousands of rams are offered as sacrifices there on the hills outside of, outside of uh, Mecca. And why do they do that? Why do they offer these sacrifices? Do you know what that's about? Ah, very important. Muslims believe that a son of Abraham was to be sacrificed. And God intervened by providing a ram, as a, the Quran says, as a tremendous substitutionary sacrifice. The word, the Quran uses the word tremendous. A tremendous substitutionary sacrifice. That's what those rams are all about. They're remembering, but they believe it was, they believe it was Ishmael, you see. The Quran doesn't say that. It just says the son of Abraham. That's what the Quran says. But Muslims believe it was Ishmael, you see. And they believe, the, the biblical account, of course, is that it was Isaac. Um, 
But let's leave, leave that aside for the moment, Ishmael or Isaac. It's a point of disagreement there. The Quran does not say that, but they believe deeply it was, it was, it was Ishmael. And, and so those sacrifices, those hundreds of thousands of sacrifices offered on the hills outside of Mecca there are a remembrance that God rescued Ishmael from death by providing a tremendous substitutionary sacrifice. That is what they think. That's what they believe, you see. A, a friend of mine uh, living in, in Sudan tells me, from Muslim background, now a believer in Jesus, tells me that someone gave him a New Testament. And he started to read the Gospel of John. And he read through chapter 1. And he reads on and on. And when Jesus comes to the Jordan River to be baptized, John the Baptist sees him coming. And he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's verse 29 of chapter 1 of, of, of John there. And he says, Oh, I said, now I understand. I often wondered why we as Muslims sacrifice hundreds of thousands of rams every year commemorating that, it, that Ishmael was saved from death by God providing a tremendous substitutionary sacrifice. I often wondered what all of that is about. And it just came clear at that moment. All of that is a sign pointing forward towards the Messiah who is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And I became a believer. And I said, who, who explained that to you? He said, the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you see, that right there in the heart of the annual pilgrimage is this sign, this powerful sign of these sacrifices that take place, not only in the pilgrimage, but in Muslim homes all over the world. Rams are sacrificed, and the feasting goes on at this feast of sacrifice. And we invite our Muslim friends, come and meet the one who is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, who is the tremendous sacrifice. Surely a ram is not a tremendous sacrifice. When the Quran says this is a tremendous sacrifice, it must be a sign, for a ram is not tremendous. You see, it must be pointing towards something tremendous. And this something tremendous is the Messiah who, who lays down his life as a sacrifice for sin. And we'll talk more about that later on, you see. But right there is a sign, right in the heart of Islam. In the midst of the sense of abandonment, you see, um, Ishmael was abandoned by Abraham. In the midst of all of that commemoration of that event, the Hagar episode, running back and forth between the hills, looking for water for her son, well nigh to death. In the midst of all of that is this sacrifice, this tremendous sacrifice that takes place as a sign of the universal sacrifice that Christ represents. Well, those are a few themes I think of as I think of the Abraham Ishmael saga as recorded in the Quran and the biblical scriptures. And um, I'll just open up for questions or comments before we break. Yes. I would say the Muslim Arabs or Muslim who become Christians ever forgave Abraham for what he did? Hmm. Yes, I think so. And I think the forgiveness uh, also happens back there in this that Ishmael and Abraham, according to the Quran, you know, worked together at rebuilding the Kaaba. You see? So Abraham, Abraham goes out and finds Ishmael, according to Islam. So he was abandoned, it's true. But the old man must have repented. <laughs> and going out there to find his son. According to the Quran, yes, yes. But that's from Muslim. That's, uh, that's from, from the Muslim That's how it works. But when the yes. Muslim become Christian, okay. they realize the different story there. Yes, yes, yes. Abraham yes, yes. never met the Isaac. Yeah, and yeah, that. yeah, yeah. How, yeah. how they... Well, what, 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 what they do, they often talk about... They often emphasize that, that Ishmael is blessed. Ishmael is blessed. God promised, I will bless Ishmael. Yeah. Yeah, I'm okay with Ishmael, but do they forgive the Abraham? Yeah, they have to forgive him. <laughs> they mean Jesus, they have to forgive him. <laughs> oh my, Abraham, the father of faith. He was a wonderful man, but he sure, he sure missed it in some ways, didn't he? It, it gives us hope, doesn't it, that if the father of faith misses it, 
the way Abraham did. Why? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Just like after Abraham and his wife Sarah made a mistake, there was uh, Ishmael, and now his uh, descendants always even trouble struggles with Israelites, and Israelites has so many problems with them as well. And in light of all of this, if you look at the big picture of the history, what then Islam? Is it the God's way to somehow bring those uh, descendants of Ishmael to faith? Or is Satan's way to uh, use them to bother Christians and uh, Israelites? Or keep the Ishmael away from Christ? Yeah, that, that's a very, very profound question, um, and maybe it's a mixture of all of that. Um, I, um, we struggle with the same thing with Judaism, don't we? I mean, Judaism has not embraced the fullness of the salvation found in Jesus. They've never accepted that he is the Messiah. Um, Paul makes the point in Romans that God nevertheless has not abandoned the Jews. Um, and that God is at work among them to, in time, uh, open their hearts to the fullness of the salvation we have in Jesus. But he says, don't boast and brag as if somehow you're special people. Uh, God has not forgotten Israel. And I, I feel much the same way in regards to Islam. God promised, I will bless Ishmael. And uh, granted, the Islamic faith is not the gospel. It is not the fullness of the revelation we have in the gospel. Um, um, but there's a yearning there, and I believe God honors that yearning. I think this is one reason that you find these accounts so often all over the world of the resurrected Jesus meeting Muslims. I mean, I don't hear those accounts in regards to Buddhists or Hindus so much. I don't. Maybe maybe he does. I don't know. I haven't heard, I haven't heard those. But Muslims, wherever I go, I hear these accounts of the resurrected Jesus meeting Muslims on the road, like, uh, like Jesus meeting Paul, on the, Saul, on the road to Damascus, you know. And I, I think it is God saying, hey, I recognize that you're very sincere, and that in all these ritual prayers and everything, and your, in your honor of Allah and all of that, there's great sincerity, but you've not understood the fullness of the gospel. The surprise has not really burst upon your soul. So he appears to reveal uh, in honor, in, 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 um, in, in, in response to their sincerity of faith. Yeah. Now, there's a, uh, there's a Muslim uh, that I'm writing a, um, a memoir with called Ahmed Haile, um, and um, now a believer in Jesus, has been a believer for many, many years. And he tells me, as we're working on these memoirs, that uh, he will never speak critically of Islam. Because he says, Islam prepared me to hear and receive the gospel. Um, even these sacrifices, these annual sacrifices. He said, I often wondered why they're going on. Well, when I met the New Testament, I then I understood that these are all signs pointing to Jesus. See? So he says, Islam was a preparation for me to receive the gospel. It wasn't the gospel. I wasn't at home yet but it planted in my soul a yearning for that which is fulfilled in Jesus. And so he says, I know where I came from, and I know where I'm going. And on the journey, I'm at home, for I've met Jesus and I've met the church. But Islam was a preparation for that journey, is what he says, you see. Um, yes? Well, there's a thing that was said, that we have mixed feelings toward our Judaism. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems like a, they accept the God and, and the mm -hmm. Elohim mm -hmm. at, the, at the one end. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, they don't, don't accept the Jews. But it's kind of like a similar to Islam. They, they kind of look and have earning for God for something. Then they, they, they don't make the last step. So, but the very interesting comparison. I just mm -hmm. want to come make yes, comments. Yes, 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 so yes. We yes. do have that in our understanding yeah, of Judaism. Yeah, 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 yeah. And should yeah. we say that Judaism was made in order to lead astray the, the Israelites, so that they never come to Jesus. No. No, we wouldn't say that. But yeah. in Islam, I mean, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. hard questions. I realize it's very yes. profound for the Christians. So. Yes. 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 Okay.
This, this Abraham, Isaac, Ishmael saga is very, very pertinent to what we're talking about here. And just remember this, if you forget everything else I said today, <laughs> God blesses Ishmael. And the church is called to bless Ishmael. And part of the blessing is to live invitationally. Did I mention in here how that uh, here, about two years ago, I was invited to the Gambia. And um, they invited me to the great tree. I'm trying to remember, did I share this Sunday morning or in here? They invited me to the great tree in the center of the town where we were. And um, they passed the word around the town that Dawood Sheikh is in town and he loves Muslims. Was that in here? Uh, th here, uh, okay, so I'll cut that. You cut it, we're finished now. Uh, you, you can cut it, we're finished now, because I already shared that here. But I'll, I'll, sh I'll just repeat it here. And so we all sat under the great tree. Even the imam came, and uh, we sat together and had such a good time. <laughs> and what I did, I said, uh, you know, Abraham's children are to bless each other. You know, whether you are from Ishmael or you're from, uh, from Isaac, you know, whatever, whatever the, the family line of your spirituality is, we're to bless each other. So what ways are you Muslims blessing Christians and what ways are Christians blessing Muslims? It was a wonderful, wonderful afternoon. And then I concluded by saying, you know, as a follower of Jesus, uh, my yearning is to bless people by bearing witness to Jesus, who is the Savior. And then the imam invited me to come to his house for more conversation. Yes. Uh, this may be not for camera, uh, for recording, but the question is about Genesis 16, 12. He will be like a wild donkey among the people. And how do all the things? Yeah, well, that, that's, that's good. Now, it's some, some biblical scholars uh, point out that, um, that this donkeys out in the desert, you know, are strong and they are, have an unpredictability about themselves as they work at survival in the desert, you know. And they're out there, in the, he's out there in the desert. And so it refers to, to Ishmael as being very creative in finding a way to live in difficult circumstances. He was out there in the wild. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a kind of affirmation, you could say, of the, of the characteristics which, uh, which Ishmael exemplified in his... Uh, but then it says, you will be like, okay, you will be strong like a donkey, but then yeah. it said, your hands on everybody, and everybody hands on you. Yeah, well, it's kind of like a prophecy yeah, yeah. for the future, is that... There's certainly been a lot of conflict in that part of the world, hasn't there? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, think, I think conflict has been part of the journey. And the conflict happened right in Abraham's home, not only out there in the desert. Uh, Ishmael and, and Isaac did not get along well together. Um, and that conflictual spirit uh, followed him. Yeah, yeah. So when we say bless Ishmael, it doesn't mean to bless everything about Ishmael. Had he humbled himself in his home and quit making fun of, uh, of Isaac and so forth, quit ab apparently abused Isaac and so forth, maybe the separation would have needed to have taken place. Maybe for a Muslim or for Arabic world, it's really hard, this attitude of the Jewish people mm -hmm. who never wants to accept them as their brothers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say secular. Yeah, I, 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 I think that might be an overstatement. It's, it's interesting that, um, uh, that um, Prime Minister Shamir, I think it was, of Egypt, when he was Prime Minister, of, of, of Israel, when he was Prime Minister, on one of his trips to Washington to work on peace accords, he had a press conference. And he said, as Jews, we must never forget that Abraham had two sons, Ishmael and Isaac, and the land belongs to both sons. We must remember that. You know, it belongs to both sons. And we have to have policies that recognize that truth, is what he said. And he certainly represented the voice of many Israelis who, in this conflict with the Muslims, um, really feel a way needs to be found to rectify, to, uh, to uh, ameliorate the conflict by recognizing there needs to be space for both, both, both communities. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, we have a break. <laughs>